Okay, welcome everyone. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for SAIC's evolution of CMMC and how it affects you small business outreach event. Um, we're really uh, excited that you're going to spend an hour with us. Um, I am Tina Richards. I'm the Chief Procurement Officer at SAIC. And I am joined by my colleague, Alicia Lynch, who is our Chief Information Security Officer. And after the presentation, we will have some time for live Q&A. You can also be uh, typing questions in the chat and we will get to um, as many as we can following the presentation. All right, so let's get started. So our agenda today is uh, Bottom line up front, we're going to tell you, um, you know, why we're doing this, which is is primarily um, an educational and informational um, agenda. We we want to make sure that our our small businesses that uh, we work with in in our supply chain, on our contracts, and and our subcontracts. Um, feel that they have have um, adequate information to be able to accept awards um, and and solicitations and bid on work that includes uh, the DFARS clauses uh, on cover um, on protected uh, information covered defense information and also we want to go over uh, the CMMC interim rule Alicia will be going into a lot of detail on that um, and then just how we partner together and coordinate with our supply chain. So as I said, um, the, the event is really about making sure that you guys um, understand the, the, um, the interim rule and the clauses that, that went into effect in the fall on November 30th. I'm sure you heard from SAIC if you are an active uh, supplier that, that is uh, receiving um, covered defense information or CUI. These clauses are now showing up in solicitations um, because it, it went into effect November 30th. We are also seeing some of our existing contracts um, that are being modified to include the new DFARS clauses. Um, also, you would be interested to know if you're if you're a federal uh, contractor working not only for the DOD but but supporting civilian agencies. Uh, we we are uh, certainly hearing that uh, CMMC framework is being evaluated by these agencies and that it is likely to be uh, incorporated in the future, uh, especially uh, the uh, GSA, DHS, and TSA. Uh, and there's some there's some um, you know, great information on the net uh, with Katie Arrington kind of supporting that fact. So um, heads up, it's it's coming it's coming to the civilian agencies. All right, so let's start with an overview of the DFARS clauses. I know talking about the DFARS is about as exciting as watching paint dry, but it is important that as a as a small business. Um, federal contractor that you understand the FAR and the DFAR and, and how it affects you. Um, so, so I'm going to go back in time a little bit and, and we'll talk about uh, the DFAR 204-7012. So this clause is not new. This clause has been around for a long time, but it really started getting prime time attention um, around 2016, 2017, when we were hearing more about um, the NIST uh, special publication 800-171, and that there was truly a timeline where uh, contractors doing work uh, for the federal government that were receiving covered defense information needed to be able to certify to their compliance. And you guys may remember that date, that impending date of December 31st, 2017. Um, it was kind of burned in all of our brains that, um, no kidding, the government is saying you've got to be compliant at this time. And they're, and, and they're going to find a way to assess your compliance. Um, so, what did all the contractors do? The primes, you know, we we uh, we hired smart people like Alicia Lynch. Um, we really doubled down on our our cyber efforts and our our um, our cyber methodology. We evaluated the NIST standard and we put a system security plan in place. And if there was a control where we knew we had to do a little more work to get compliant, we had a POAM, um, a plan of action and a milestone. 
So this is probably not new information to you if you've been working um, in this space for a while, but it's, it's the backdrop for what we're going to talk about today. So the interim rule that went into to play in November and the new DFARS um, that coincidentally everything is happening you know, at the same time are moving us beyond just getting a certification that you're compliant. You know, um, I'm sure if you work for SASE as a, as, a, as a sub, you've seen our cert, a cert in where you would check a box and say whether or not you were compliant with 204-7012. Um, now the government is, is taking it further by saying, um, we're going to ensure that all of our all of our supply base, the, the defense industrial base, if they're getting um, CUI or CDI, we need to make sure that they are consistently, everyone's being evaluated consistently, and we want to see what the results of their evaluation are. And so um, they, they have a, a tool, the SPRS system, and all of the suppliers are supposed to do their um, basic self-assessment and load their summary score in there. And then CMMC itself is going even beyond the NIST. And like I said, Alicia will go into more detail on this, but it's a, it's a framework that isn't just about the, the 110 controls. It's really about an organization's cyber posture, their cyber processes. And when I, when I think of it, I like to, I like to think in terms of um, stories and metaphors, I think about, um, about health. So say you're, um, you know, you're reasonably healthy, you eat a good diet, you control your portions, and you, you don't have dessert every night. Um, maybe you get eight to 10,000 steps a day. So you're, you're doing pretty well. Um, most people would say that's a healthy person. But then let's say you decide you want to train for a 5k. So now you're, you're cutting out that refined sugar and you're, you know, you're not taking in as much fat and you're not having that second glass of wine with dinner and you're getting up early a couple of days a week and hitting the gym or going for a run. And then you, you hit that 5K and you're like, you know what, man, I'm going to go for a half marathon. I am, I am doubling down. Um, I am, I'm, I'm lifting weights. I'm doing my cardio. You're evolving. It starts to become part of your DNA. It's affecting the decisions you make about what you eat and how you train and how you live your life. CMMC is like that. Um, it's an evolution where you go from that, you know, basic hitting your 10,000 steps a day to a stair step to being maybe an elite athlete. Um, so I hope I hope that helps frame, frame it up for you. It helped me. Um, OK, so moving on. Um, and I guess just the takeaway from this slide is. We, we need to work together. Um, SAIC doesn't go off and do all this work for the government on our own. We are partnering with, with businesses large and small to ensure that we are, are um, delivering what the government needs and when they need it, but also, and very importantly, that we are delivering it safely and securely and we are protecting our nation's data. And we do that together with our supply chain. Okay, so um, the DFARS clauses. Hopefully you have already read these um, and, and maybe read them a few times. I know I always have to read them a few times because they're, they're, they're not written by laymen. These are not fun, um, but the, the DFAR is kind of like a guidebook and it is actually very prescriptive and very helpful. Um, there were three clauses that came out with uh, when the interim rule came out that went into play November 30th. So um, let's start with, with 7019. 7019 is like a herald. It's like that guy that blows the bugle before the king walks out. It's just saying, Putting you on notice, um, the requirements for the contractor to get their score in SPRS is in your contract. So if you if you see a solicitation from SAIC or another contractor and you see that clause, then you know, boy, oh, I better have my my score in in SPRS, and it needs to be you know reasonably current. It can't be older than three years. And then um, with 7019, if 7019 is in there its brother is going to be there or its sister, 7020. And 7020 is saying, okay, not only do you have to load your summary score as it stated in 7019, 
um, the government may need to come in and, and assess what you've provided. They, they will need to have, potentially, um, if there's a higher level requirement, they may need to um, access your facilities, um, look at your controls and your systems, talk to your personnel. Um, so, so this is more of a, a verification. So um, not just trust, uh, but trust, but verify. And then we get to um, 204721. And that clause, uh, we, we aren't going to be seeing that much this year because that is the actual CMMC requirements clause. And that clause requires that the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment has approved the use of that clause in your contract. We do um, expect that uh, a handful, uh, up to possibly 15 contracts are going to include these requirements uh, in 2021, but by and large, this is going to be um, you know, a, a very unique situation just, just to be used for the pilots. But it will require that the contractor maintain whatever the uh, requisite CMMC level is. So let's just assume, say, a level three, because there's CUI involved, that they uh, maintain that CMMC uh, level three for the duration of the contract. But again, I just want to foot stomp. This clause is being rolled out over uh, the next five years. There will be very few contracts that have this in 2021. But after 2025, fall of 2025, um, it will be in every contract that has uh, CUI or CDI. And um, that's just, that's every contract unless it's specifically for COTS commercial off-the-shelf items. So even commercial items for Part 12 contracts uh, will have this clause. Uh, only COTS items would not. Okay, so how is SEIC coordinating with its supply chain? Well, um, our, our subs and our suppliers, as I mentioned, you know, this is an ecosystem. We don't do this on our own. So it's really important that we are we are talking, that we are assessing and, and reviewing our suppliers and our subcontractors. And if um, if the clause gets modified at a SASC prime contract, we in turn would modify the subcontract or, or purchase order if it's active. And um, under the interim rule, as we mentioned before, attestation is no longer acceptable. You've got to load your score. And the, the contracting officers will be checking it out. They'll check the cage codes that are in use on a particular prime contract. And then they will check in SPRS to make sure that that summary level score has been loaded before award. So um, this is how we move from attestation to verification. And if you if you are listening to this presentation, but you're new to federal contracting, you're just you know dabbling and thinking you might want to get into it, and we and we hope you do. Um, you may not have a summary level score loaded yet. So the bottom of this slide is the the website. You can conduct your own basic assessment. So that would be to the 110 controls of of the NIST standard, and you can email them to this to this. Uh, link or you can go into SPRS and just complete it um, real time. And this is just a little screenshot of what the basic assessment looks like. Um, you, you would have to complete this for every system that was being used in performance um, of your order. And this is the uh, link to the DOD assessment methodology which would give you all the controls of the NIST standard. So how, how are we addressing this? As I mentioned, you know, we have to assess our supply chain. And in turn, we want our suppliers to be assessing their supply chain. Because as you know, um, th this can go down several tiers to get to the deliverable that is actually going to the government. So it's very important that we are um, not just SAAC making sure if that first tier is covered, woohoo, We've got to make sure that the second tier is covered and the third tier is covered. And, and we are all on the hook for that. So um, 
we we send out a, a certification and you've seen it. If you've been with us for a while, you've seen this thing evolve. Um, but we have now aligned the cert in to, to the new requirements. It's not just asking, hey, are you compliant with uh, 204 7012? It's now asking, are you compliant with 204 7012? And are you compliant with um, 204 7020? And do you have your summary level score loaded? Because to be eligible for award, you, you have to have a check in that box. Um, and this certification, this cert in, it's an annual certification, and we will be, you know, getting one if, if you're an active supplier, we'll get one every year from you. Also, um, SAC has a, a tool called Cornerstone. You guys, if you're doing business with us, you're familiar with this tool. You've had to go through MFA enablement and identity proofing to be able to get into this tool. This is how we transact business. We, we issue our RFQs and RFPs through this tool. We receive offers through this tool um, and invoices on the, on the subcontractor side come in through this tool. So um, we've added a supplier evaluation tool where you can actually go in and in real time answer the questions and you'll get a score and that score is helpful for you um, if you haven't done this methodology yet and you just want to you want to get a, an idea of where you are um, and for us because it gives us an idea of what your your cyber maturity is um, and then if you see that you're, you know, you're green, 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 and then there's some yellow or even some red, then that's that's the moment when you say, wow, I've got some things I need to shore up. I think I'm going to I'm going to talk with my buyer and my SCA about this. And then we would engage with our cyber team um, to see if there's, you know, if if you are eligible, they may want to talk with you and ask some questions. Um, but but bottom line, we we want to partner with you. We want you to get uh, compliance so that we can do business with you. So what should you be doing? Well, the first thing, um, and I imagine if you're on this on this presentation, you're already probably doing a lot of things. You you are invested. You know it's your responsibility and your duty to protect our nation's data. Um, but there, it's possible that there are people listening right now that are different levels of maturity. So if anything I've said um, about the DFARS or the interim rule is, um, you know, sounding like a foreign language to you or, or is just new to you, read the clauses. The, the first step is always to, to be informed. Read the DFARS clauses read the interim rule, and I would read um, the assessment methodology so you understand the NIST controls. Um, and if, if you have a cyber, um, you know, a CISO or a, an IT team with cyber in, the, you know, is part of their responsibilities, they are really going to have to double down. I mean, we as professionals in this environment, we need to be aware of the rules and the regulations. We need to understand the pond we swim in. But, but those guys, they they really need to um, you know shore up their their expertise. Or if you're a very small business, there are there are third parties that you can reach out to. Um, you know there are companies that can help you with getting compliant. And Alicia's going to talk a little bit more about this. These are not necessarily uh, companies that can certify you, but there are all kinds of firms out there that are doing this as a business, helping our small businesses get compliant with the standard. Um, you'll want to make sure you have a, a system security plan. You're going to need to make sure that you have any, if you have any POAMs where you're not quite there, but you have a date that you're tracking that and you're making progress to getting compliant by your dates. Um, of course, ensure that you've done your basic assessment and that it's loaded and and stay informed. There are all kinds of circulars out there. There are law firms, um, Crowell and Mooring, they put out information all the time. There are CMMC podcasts. Um, Alicia recently did a, a, a interview um, and you can look for it on LinkedIn. There is so much information on this. Um, we really have no reason to, to remain in ignorance. There's a whole industry um, there to help you. And as a prime, uh, we're here to help you as well navigate, you know, some of these very complicated regulatory waters. 
that's it for me. Um, and I, at this time, am, am going to turn you over to um, our very amazing Alicia Lynch, our, our um, Chief Information Security Officer and, and my partner in crime. We are always working very closely together to ensure that we are um, keeping our supply chain safe. Alicia? Great. Thank you, Tina. Thanks for that introduction. That's very, very kind of you. Um, let's go ahead and roll to the next slide. So Tina did a really thorough and great job of helping us understand what are the requirements of the interim clauses that we have been that's been placed upon us by the Department of Defense. And she also talked a lot about you doing your own assessment and loading your score into SPURS. So I don't want to repeat a lot of what she said, but I am going to foot stomp some good things that she mentioned and talk a little bit more detail on some of them. But first thing I wanted to talk to first and foremost is why we're doing CMMC. Why do the Defense contractors have to do it, right? And I thought the best thing to start off with was, let's go to the next slide. I normally give briefings, you know, internal to SIIC around the different threats that we're facing as defense contracting company. And this particular threat that I'm going to talk about just for a couple minutes is about China, right? It's considered an APT, which is an advanced persistent threat. Their national strategy is to be the number one superpower in the world and to de dethrone the United States in military capability. And how they're going about doing this in their strategy is they're coming into our, uh, they can't get into the defense systems because they're highly protected. So they attack the soft underbelly of the defense department, which is the supply chain, the defense department supply chain, which we all are a part of that, right? So they are, here's a great example. I'm gonna give you three examples, right? So here's the first one. What you see here on the right-hand side is the American F-22 Raptor fighter. It's a single pilot uh, weapon system aircraft. And then on the left, you see the Chinese J-20. They are identical in nature. And the reason being is because the Chinese um, have succeeded in exfiltrating the data to be able to build this system. This cost the, the U.S. government billions of dollars in lost uh, our, you know, research and development hours, funding, et cetera. And um, the Chinese get it for free and they get it very quickly. And it, they're quickly implementing something that's taken typically the United States government about 20 years to plan and prep for and get into production. Let's go to the next slide. So here's another example. It's the American on top. You'll see the American F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, which uh, was built by Lockheed Martin. And you can see the similarities between the Chinese J-31. They're exactly identical aircraft. So again, a huge loss of data and a very significant impact on our U.S. military for, because we could potentially in the future go to battle with the Chinese with weapon systems that have the same capability as ours when we need to maintain superior, you know, superiority in those, in those areas. And let's go to the, to the next slide, please. And the, I thought I'd get one in there for the Navy. So on the left there, you see this is the Navy's new littoral combat ship. It's been in service probably about 10 years, but for the military, that's 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 pretty new. Um, it's a small surface vessel, highly maneuverable. It has, you can't see there, but it has a trimarian hull capability, which means it has three hulls in the back and it makes it more easy to maneuver at rapid speed where it won't, won't capsize or turn over. And it's designed for near shore operations. And then what you see there on the right, is the Chinese type 917 salvage and rescue high performance frigate, which is the exact same uh, capabilities and characteristics as our littoral combat ship there. So just to really kind of do a little bit of shock and awe with you all to get you to understand why the Department of Defense has put these interim rules on us, everything from the NIST, the, the FAR, the DFAR, the NIST 8171, now the CMMC, is because they're trying to protect this very important data uh, that we are are in receipt of from contracts that we're working on with the Department of Defense. Let's go to the next slide, please. So some of our concerns regarding cybersecurity, the government spent a lot of effort in providing, um, you know, good relationships and uh, information to the defense industrial base, which we're all a part of. But we still continue, even though they go to these extremes to put the FARS clauses in, the DFARS, the NIST 8171, they're going you know, to these extremes to help us 
uh, enable the security controls and requirements and hygiene that we need in our environments, but we're still we're still not doing what they're asking, right? So to Tina's point, she made about 8171 clear back in December 2017. The government asked us to self-attest and say that we were had met the 110 controls. So a lot of companies did that. They self-attested that they were in fact compliant. And what happened has happened many times is that different uh, suppliers have been uh, breached and data has been exfilled in relationship to a lot of the weapon system platforms that I've just showed you and others too. There's probably been over 50 programs that have had data exfilled from them. And what the government has the right and authority to do is go in and get the forensic data on those breaches and look and see what caused the breach, right? So what typically has happened is they've taken a look at this and they've identified that the controls that companies have said that they have in place weren't in fact not in place, right? So that's why they're amping up on us and they have brought now the CMMC requirements into play here. Next slide. What I've done here is I've taken a look at, you know, some of the findings from the government and they've found that a lot of breaches wouldn't have happened if there was multi-factor authentication in place. And they, when they looked at the company, um, they said they had it on their assessment, but yet they did not actually have it enabled. There was others that were uh, a lot that were identified around uh, the enforcement and use of strong passwords and also having a capability to uh, monitor your environment to see that if there's any vulnerabilities that need patching and then actually having processes in place to go in and patch those vulnerabilities so that you won't get exploited. What the government has found is that a lot of companies attested to that they had those processes, but in fact, they didn't have that. And there are a lot of systems that weren't even patched for, for, for years. So. Uh, so they have strong evidence and that's the reason why that they've now uh, you know, deployed the CMMC requirements and we have to adhere to those now. Next slide, please. All right, so who does the CMMC impact? I think Tina has talked, you know, pretty, uh, you know, at length about it. And I would say that for every company that is on this um, webinar, that most likely you will be impacted by the CMMC um, requirements, right? It This is the, again, the government's further ability to get increased assurance and validation that you are enabling the controls that they've told you to enable. What's good about the CMMC is that it isn't coming out of left field. It's not something that they just made up um, and, and they're springing on us something new. It's building upon the requirements that they've already told us to uh, put into place. So the FAR, the DFARS, the NIST, and even the capability maturity model integration, the CMMI, which really takes organizations up a level in their maturity levels. So it's taking those models, which the government's already asked us to put in anyways, and it's building upon those. So if you've already done your NIST 8171, 110 controls, then you're, you're actually in a good spot right now. If you've attested that you've done them, but you really haven't, then you need to go ahead and you're gonna have to kick it up a level and get it and get those completed. All right, one, one thing too that Tina talked about was the flow down requirements. So um, there was a little bit of fuzziness prior to the CMMC around if we had the clause in our contract as a prime and we flowed it down to you, what, that was good enough. But now they're looking to make sure that we're doing our due diligence with our supply chain and ensuring that we're helping and assisting you in, in any way possible to make sure that you've enabled the controls, especially when we flowed CUI clauses down in our contracts to you. And also, um, which makes it, you know, visibility is very difficult in the supply chain um, because we lose control basically after we give it to our first tier suppliers. And then those suppliers start to use other suppliers. So you can get to tier two and three and four. And we, in essence, are still supposed to have some visibility over that to understand who you're flowing that those uh, CUI clauses down to and that you're making sure that your supply chain are just as compliant as we have required you to be. Uh, Tina did mention it's not applicable to COTS, so that's a good thing. And um, she did also mention that by 2026, all organizations in the DOD supply chain will have CMMC requirements at some point. So it's really important, I guess, right now for suppliers to either fish or cut bait, decide you want to stay with the DOD and work inside the DOD uh, framework and enable those controls or 
or get out totally, but you probably should make the decision to, before you make the commitment of resources and time to get, get yourself compliant. Next slide. All right, so what I've got here is just a little bit, going to delve a little bit into the CMMC levels, right? So there are five levels, one through five. Five is actually the highest level that you can get. Um, the number one, the basic level number one is just basic cyber hygiene. And you're going to see those are the most minimum requirements. And you're going to see that in uh, federal contract information if that's put into your contract. That's, the, that's what you're going to have to be compliant with. And if you look at number three, level three is considered good. It's just good cyber hygiene, right? And CMMC level three is required for any contracts that you're going to receive that has controlled unclassified information in it, which I call CUI, right? So think about this. NIST 800-171 was in play before CMMC, and you had to have those 110 controls in place. And you could have POAMs, to, Tina mentioned that. You could have POAMs to say that we're working on our maturity to get these complete. CMMC will not allow for POAMs whatsoever. So you have to have the 110 controls from 800-171 in place without POAMs and the additional 20 controls for CMMC level three to get certified at that level. And the one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I mentioned it briefly, is that it's really, upon you as the supply chain um, at the company level to determine like, what is your strategy? Where do you wanna be? Do you wanna be in the defense side and the federal side, or do you wanna be just in commercial side? If you wanna be in defense and federal, then what level of uh, you know contracts do you wanna work on? How much do you wanna invest in order to get yourself to the level you need to be to compete within that space, right? And once you determine that as a company, what your strategy is gonna be, then you need to set out and make sure that you meet those compliance levels with the controls that are needed for those levels. Next slide. This slide's gonna be just to give you a, a little bit more information about how it builds, how the CMMC levels build on themselves. So if you look to the left of the slide, we're talking about level one, which is basic cyber hygiene. And in order to meet the FAR requirements, you have to implement about 17 controls, right? And that's been standing for a long time. And then get to level two, you're going to have to do what you had to do for basic level one, those 17 practices. So that's complying with the FAR. And then you're going to get 48 other 800-171 REV1 controls that you have to put into place in order to get to, to level two. There are going to be seven additional practices that you have to do that supports uh, a higher level of cyber hygiene as well. So that's just to get to level two. And then if you want to move up to level three, you have to do what you had to do for one and two. And then you add on the fact that you have to do all of the NIST 800-171 controls. And then there are 20 uh, supplemental controls that you have to do in order to get to CMMC level three. So I think I'll stop there right now because I think that's far enough for most of us here in this call to get to CMMC level three. And then if you aspire to level four and five, I have it, the information there on how you're going to get to that. All right, let's go to the next slide. And for those of you that want to geek out with my cyber team, I did have my team take a deep dive onto the domain. So NIST 171 has had four, has 14 domains. CMMC has 17. So the delta between 800-171 and CMMC is that they've added the three new domains, which is asset management, recovery, and situational awareness, right? So another thing that I had my team do was take a look at each one of these domains, how many controls do you have to implement to get to CMMC level five? So you'll see that across the top there if you look at the access control. And then if you look at level one, uh, they've color coded it. So you'll be able to see all the different domains and how many controls that you have to put in place, place at each level in order to be compliant for the level that you want to be at. Um, that's a little complicated, but it, it'll save you some time in having to figure that out yourself and, and to break that down. So Tina did mention this, right? In 2017, you could self-assess, self-attest. In CMMC 2021, you cannot. You have to be assessed by an outside party. And these are called C3PAOs. That stands for CMMC Third Party Assessor Organization. And this is a very strictly controlled group of companies. Um, the uh, Katie Arrington's office there at DOD CISO office is, 
has oversight of the board, which is a CMMC accreditation board, and they have put in lots of controls in place to make sure that all of the assessors are trained to the exact same standard and level. There's a lot of hurdles they have to jump over. They have to do, you know, a right seat ride with um, the government assessors who are actually doing uh, CMMC assessment and accreditation visits. They have to do a right seat ride with the government before they can actually get certified to be a legitimate assessor for, for the Department of Defense. So there's a lot of strict criteria. There's a lot of companies out there right now. They're saying that we'll help you get your CMMC you know, level, whatever accreditation. And they probably can. They're probably good companies that ha can help you enable the controls. But they, you have to make sure that the assessor that you're using is certified by the DOD and can actually give you that certificate. So don't go spending a lot of money unless you know that the assessor is on the actual Department of Defense uh, you know, accredited list. That list is not out yet. It's probably going to come out in the late spring, early summer. And um, I'll, I know that Tina will provide you all with that information as soon as we receive it as well. So make sure that you're, you're working with a legitimate certified assessor who can assess you for your CMMC levels to get your accreditation. And Tina did mention that um, I think a lot of uh, don't be thinking that you're going to be unimpacted by this. I think there's a lot of tentacles that are already out there. It's not just in the Defense Department. She talked a little bit about Katie Arrington is working very diligently with GSA, DHS, and TSA to get these organizations to accept the CMMC standards and to implement them for their contracts as well. So it looks like it's going to have a, a tendency to maybe proliferate to outside of DOD to federal and other organizations as well. Next slide. All right. Uh, Tina did talk about the timeline, and I just want to bring to your attention that in this fiscal year for the Department of Defense, there are going to be 15 contracts with, uh, with the CMMC language in them. It's going to be for levels one through three because they only have the assessment criteria published for one through three, and they're still working on the assessment criteria for levels four and five. That has not been published yet. Um, and I think that they want to start small in their first, um, they've done some pilots and this is their actual, you know, going live with this and they want to start small before they get into the level four and five control assessments. Um, a lot of you might even be aware of that. You might be aware that there's RFPs out now for these 15 and you can see how this 15 seems small, but as you start to look at all the suppliers and the base that you need to support big contracts like this, we're going to get into probably thousands of suppliers that will need a, an accreditation of a CMMC level one to three in order to support these 15 contracts. And she mentioned, Tina mentioned that in September 30th, 2025, that there's going to be advanced uh, requirements for CMMC on, and the number that I have right now and I'm tracking is 475 programs by 2025. And again, that's going to, for 475 programs, that's going to exponentially increase to thousands and thousands and thousands of subs that are going to be supporting those 475 programs. So that many will need to have CMMC level one through, by 2025, they'll have the, the four and five out. So either level one through level five. And then after October 1st, 2025, it will be in all future contracts at that point. So if you want to work within the DOD, you will have to have a CMMC level certification as well as probably in the federal government. And one thing to note here, I think Tina may have mentioned it as well, but you can compete on RFPs if you can in fact get at the level of certification that they need you to by contract award. So you're not gonna be awarded the contract for a level, CMMC level three or a level four, and then be allowed the time to get your company to that level. You'll have to have met that prior to contract award. So that's important note. And for those of you that's, you know, already implemented a lot of these controls, you know, there, it takes a lot of runway to put those 110 controls and then the additional 20 for CMMC level three. And if you go beyond that, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of resources, and sometimes it takes a lot of money to get the right uh, applications in place for you to technically control these uh, these controls that you have to uh, implement. And let's go to the next slide. All right. So what I've put together here are some really cool websites for you to take a look at if 
you know, it, those of you, there's a lot of you here who probably already know these. Um, and then some of you who are new to the game and want to learn, you can, you can certainly go to the CMMC website. You can go to the CMMC accreditation board website. Uh, you can learn about the DFARS interim rules that Tina's talked about. And also uh, we use the term CUI and a lot of people, trust me, it's, it's, it's still a new thing, even though it's been out for several years, understand, trying to understand what CUI really is and making sure that you're getting it identified in your contract so that you know how to protect that data. So really good website there for the DOD CUI piece. And what I did put on the top here is that there was a CMMC accreditation board update on 26 January, just was uh, last week or so. And it was a really good, um, a really good update. It was really long. So I have to caution you, it was about an hour and a half, but you can go ahead and, and click on that. And it's going to give you, I've tried to take what I, what the data that they put out in that um, town hall and really condense it down for you all today. But certainly if you want to get more in-depth data, I would, I would uh, recommend that you go and you listen to that as well. And um, you'll see there the chairman of the CMC Accreditation Board, which is Carlton Johnson, and then Katie Arrington does a little um, little video at the beginning. Um, she dials into that, so you'll get to see her if you don't know who she is. So that was uh, kind of fast and furious. I know Tina and I try to pack a lot into a short amount of time, but we do want to um, make sure that you have a really good understanding of what the requirements are on youth. 